Welcome back to Nick's Virtual EMS Classroom. We're going to pick back up with Toxicology Part 2, which will actually have several parts to it. We're going to talk about uh, abuse and overdose with specific substances and the uh, management that would go along with it. In this particular short lecture, we're going to talk about alcohol abuse, stimulants, and marijuana. Your emergency medical care across the board for all toxicological patients is going to be as follows. You've got to ensure your scene safety. Make sure your airway is maintained. The patient may be unable to maintain their own airway based off of what they have uh, been exposed to or overdosed on. Ensure that breathing is adequate. Ensure that circulation is not compromised. Administer high concentration oxygen if necessary. Establish vascular access. Consider administering an antidote if one's available. Also, prepare to manage shock, coma, seizures, and dysrhythmias. Remember that these toxicological substances can cause all kinds of um, systemic effects. And then, of course, you want to transport as soon as possible because they need definitive care that most likely you will not be able to provide in the field. So, alcohol abuse or alcohol. The form of alcohol consumed by humans in alcoholic beverages is ethyl alcohol or ethanol. It's not conventionally recognized as a poison, even though it has properties of a poison when ingested in sufficient quantities. So alcohol is undeniably part of human society, and overindulgence is often part of that, which leads to acute alcohol intoxication. According to a 2015 study by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, approximately 87% of people age 18 years or older have consumed alcohol at some point in their lives. Furthermore, more, almost 27% of people age 18 years or older reported that they had engaged in binge drinking within the past month. With increased alcohol use comes an increased risk of developing alcoholism, a disorder characterized by physical and psychological addiction to ethanol. Alcohol abuse has several warning signs, but again, all patients don't read the textbook, so some patients or some people, not just patients, but some people have a very good way of hiding their issues. Consuming large quantities over a long period of time, spending considerable time obtaining, using, or recovering, experiencing social problems, reducing social, occupational, or recreational activities. All of these are signs of alcohol abuse. Psychological dependence on alcohol involves drinking to function normally and feeling good. The, the mindset has gotten used to the, the changes to the body that the alcohol presents. Alcohol acts as a depressant in the frontal lobe and can alter the decision-making processes and or decrease a, pe a person's inhibitions. The psychological dependence may escalate until people feel they require alcohol to survive socially or emotionally. A person with alcoholism is more prone to serious illness and injuries and you should always look for uh, signs of withdrawal, especially if the patient has um, suddenly stopped using alcohol. Withdrawal symptoms include restlessness, anxiousness, sleeping problems, agitation, and tremors. And for those with more serious physical dependence, significant symptoms include hypertension, tachycardia, vomiting, hallucination, delirium tremens, alcohol withdrawal, delirium that can be fatal. People with severe dependence may go to extreme lengths to obtain the alcohol, even drinking things that are not typically consumed but have some form of alcohol in them mouthwash, hand sanitizer, other extracts of alcohol. CNS effects range from neurotransmitter imbalances to structural breakdown and diminished cognitive and motor function abilities. Alcohol also irritates tissues in the GI system, causing many GI conditions. Alcohol abuse is a risk factor for some cancers, including cancer of the mouth and esophagus, and their severe toxic effects on the liver. Impaired ability to metabolize and filter harmful substances with the liver. It also causes fluid backup and elevated pressures in the hepatic system, which can lead to portal hypertension, um, can lead to esophageal varices, and then, of course, rupture of these varices as well. For acute alcohol intoxication, airway is going to be very important because the CNS system has been depressed. 
you want to make sure that that patient is able to maintain their airway or at least have the ability to maintain their airway. Um, have your suction available, provide oxygen if needed. Um, make sure the patient does not aspirate. Also, you can consider thiamine if directed by med control. Typically, thiamine is going to be um, administered to patients that have chronic alcohol issues. So what about withdrawal seizures or withdrawal symptoms as well? So withdrawal seizures usually occur within 12 to 48 hours of the last drink. You want to use the same care described for alcohol intoxication, but you also want to consider administering benzodiazepines, which probably would not be a good idea for somebody that is just acutely intoxicated with alcohol. This is a total different pathophysiology here. Delirium tremens usually starts 48 to 82 hours after the last drink. And the signs and symptoms, confusion, tremors, restlessness, fever, diaphoresis, tachycardia, hypotension, hallucinations, extreme responsiveness to external stimuli, and decreased cognitive function to the point to where they don't even recognize where they're at. Delirium tremens can be very, very harmful to the patient. In the case that the patient is experiencing DTs, uh, try to keep the patient calm, maintain personal safety, and also follow protocols for benzodiazepine use, uh, but you may need to do something to keep this patient at bay. Um, they very well could be very dangerous. Administer supplemental oxygen by nasal cannula if needed. Establish vascular access, maintain an ongoing dialogue, make sure that you do not buy into their uh, hallucinations, and you try to provide reassurance for these patients. Stimulants. These have various forms that allow for absorption by ingestion, inhalation, or injection. Clinical presentations are going to um, include things that, that would be overactive uh, function of the sympathetic nervous system. Both licit and illicit forms can have devastating effects on those who abuse them. Agitation, anxiousness, delirium, dilated pupils, difficulty sitting still, a hypermetabolic state which could lead to increased body temperature, profuse sweat, thin appearance, track marks. All, all of these are essentially caused by the release of catecholamines which stimulate the central nervous system. Now, some stimulants are illegal, such as Adderall or Vyvanse or Ritalin. These types of uh, medications actually are designed to stimulate the central nervous system to increase alertness and create um, a sense of, of more focus. However, these can be abused as well. These are a little bit of a different chemical um, makeup than, say, your um, methamphetamines. Um, Cocaine is alkaloid extracted from the erythroxylin coca. The effects of the body are going to depend on the um, patient's form that they are taking. Are they smoking crack cocaine or is it refined cocaine? Um, cocaine is a local anesthetic and a nervous system stimulant. It enhances the release and activity of neurotransmitters in the body, including norepi, dopamine, and serotonin. One chemical form of cocaine, water-soluble hydro hydrochloride salt, is quickly absorbed across all mucal, uh, mucosal membranes. This is a form that is uh, snorted, swallowed, or injected intravenously. Another form of cocaine, crack cocaine, is simply cocaine mixed with two inexpensive ingredients, baking soda and water. After the ingredients have mixed together into a paste-like slurry and cooked or baked, the end result is smokable cocaine. Cocaine Users with serious dependence problems may have significant health conditions as well as uh, social and psychological challenges. Cocaine is a local anesthetic and a nervous system stimulant. When it induces the release of dopamine, this activity creates a euphoria that features enhanced alertness and a tremendous sense of well-being. Norepinephrine activity results in stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, and this, stimula this stimulation leads to common adverse effects such as tachycardia, hypertension, and hyperthermia. Every organ system is at risk due to significant vasoconstriction, 
along with increased metabolic and oxygen demands from the cells. More frequent use and use of poor forms, purer forms result in greater dependence and tolerance. When the effects wear off, the user experiences a crash characterized by depression, irritability, exhaustion, and possibly washout, which leads to a hypoactive due to the lack of the neurotransmitters that are being released. These types of patients may be very difficult to assess. To avoid crashing, many users seek more cocaine or take a sedative, which is then going to run into issues with polypharmacy. Overdose may lead to chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, psychosis, ventricular dysrhythmias, myocardial infarction, and sudden cardiac arrest. Amphetamines. A couple of different types. You've got methamphetamine, methylene dioxyamphetamine, and methylene dioxymethamphetamine. There are a number of clinical applications for amphetamines. However, uh, there are a lot of illicit use as well. So methamphetamine is low cost and long acting. Ingredients are available locally, and the patient management is the same for cocaine. Um, you've got to be very careful in these situations if these patients um, are in their place of preferred meth making. Meth labs should be treated as hazardous material incident. Um, your clinical presentation, uh, for a lack of a better word, tweaking, um, almost identical to that of the person abusing cocaine. Um, one of the big differences, though, is that these effects from these drugs last many hours longer than cocaine um, to the point to where some folks stay up these on the end. Um, as far as management goes, uh, you've just got to be very careful because these patients are increasingly paranoid and even psychotic. You want to make sure that you've got law enforcement. Basalts. So basalts are very, very serious here. A uh, substance related to the chemical compound derived from the cot plant. Engineered for higher potency. This is synthetic cathinons or basalts. They're psychoactive substances related uh, to the chemical compound derived from the cot plant. The uh, cot leaves are traditionally chewed for a stimulant and euphoric effect. The synthetic cathinones are chemically engineered to have a higher potency. And they're popular because they offer effects similar to stimulants, but usually cost less. Bath salts are sometimes sold as plant food or cleaners and are labeled as not for human consumption. Don't confuse these with like Epsom salt or other bathing products. These are actually going to be the things that you've seen sold in the uh, the seedy um, gas stations and things like that. They often have a wider brown crystal-like appearance and come in foil packages with names like Flocka, Cloud9, White Lightning. And they can be uh, ingested, insulated, smoked, or injected. The speed of onset depends on the route of absorption, and the two routes associated with the highest mortality are encephalation and needle injection. Your more serious signs, hallucinations, paranoia, incredible strength, excited delirium. These make these very dangerous patients. So as far as management of stimulant abuse, you want to make sure that you're continually watching these patients. You may have to administer bindos, uh to help them uh, calm down, especially if they're in a um, excited delirium state. Uh, for violent behavior, follow local protocols or contact medical control for sedation, but you want to make sure that you are keeping yourself safe. Fluid resuscitation may be required for hypoperfusion. Assess for cardiac dysrhythmias. Treat chest pain as acute coronary syndrome because very possibly they have overtaxed their heart to the point to where they are having this issue. Um, vasospasm may be causing some of the patient's symptoms. You may want to consider uh, sublingual nitroglycerin every three minutes as long as systolic pressure greater than 100 millimeters and until pain resolves. If they are experiencing seizures, again, you may want to consider um, benzodiazepines. Aggressive cooling may be indicated for hyperthermia and signs of delirium or severe agitation. Again, this is from the, um, from the overaction of the metabolic system. 
Throughout resuscitation, maintain urine output with aggressive fluid therapy. Again, this has multiple system effects. You may have to consider chemical restraints. Other drugs you may consider, Haldol. Haldol may uh, be given intramuscularly, so it may be a, a drug to um, uh, consider. Uh, should the situation worsen into status epilepticus, you may consider a phenobarbital or rectal diazepam. In addition, neuromuscular blockade may be needed to control motor activity to avoid hyperthermia, acidosis, and potentially rhabdomyolysis. Now slowing down just a little bit, marijuana and cannabis compounds. Marijuana and cannabis compounds are derived from harvested and dried cannabis uh, uh, sativa plant. Marijuana is also known as weed, pot, dope, smoke. The resin from the flower tops can be used to produce hashish or also known as hash. There's a lot of controversy over whether um, the clinical use of marijuana should be um, legal. Um, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that um, marijuana um, actually does have some positive uh, clinical effects. Marijuana remains the most commonly used illicit drug in the United States with approximately 32% of people ages 18 to 25 years using marijuana within the last year. It contains a, a number of cannabis compounds which may have different therapeutic effects. CBD, which is one of the main active chemical compounds, may have significant therapeutic effects including anti-seizure, neuroprotective properties, analgesia, anti-tumor properties. CBD does not have the euphoric or intoxicant intoxicating effects of THC, which is the intoxicant chemical of marijuana. It has served as the driving force for some states to enact laws to allow access to cannabidiol or high CBD strains of marijuana. Assessment and management intoxication withdrawal from marijuana are not life-threatening. Novice users may become panicked or anxious due to the euphoria, spatial disorientation, and uh, altered sense of reality that can occur. Emotional support and supportive care are often all that's needed. Possibly a benzo, but typically the patient is pretty uh, laid back as it is when they're high. Pediatric patients may experience more serious signs and symptoms after ingestion of an edible food source that's been adulterated with marijuana, like lollipops, brownies, gummy bears. Occasionally, you may encounter a patient with cannab cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. This involves cyclic episodes of nausea and vomiting in chronic cannabis users. Uh, these patients will need IV fluids and antiemetics. And the last thing we're going to talk about in this particular section is spice, which is a uh, blend of synthetic cannab uh, cannabinoids. These are similar to synthetic cathinones. Spice is a synthetic cannabinoid that falls into the category of, of new psychoactive substances. Because the cannabinoids act on the same cellular receptor as THC, spice is often marketed as synthetic marijuana. However, the active substance is a blend of chemicals that are either sprayed onto plant material for smoking or sold as a liquid for rising in electronic cigarettes. Adverse effects of spice include psychosis, hallucinations, tachycardia, vomiting, renal conditions, and seizures. As with synthetic cathinones, it can be challenging to obtain a good assessment and form a treatment plan for someone who has used spice. Various chemicals may have been used in the spice. Patient presentations may vary. Supportive care with fluids and antiemetics is often appropriate. If the patient is experiencing a seizure, then benzodiazepines are the medication of choice. So once again, thank you for listening to part two of Toxicology. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, nickray at suscc.edu. <laughs>